Hi friends, Father Kerry Walters here, and this is another Holy Spirit moment. This one, reflecting on why it is that Ulysses is in hell. Ulysses is the Latinized version of the Greek name Odysseus, and Odysseus, of course, is one of the heroes of Homer's Iliad. Odysseus is the wily captain who brought the towers of proud Troy down by introducing into the city the Trojan horse. He was considered a hero amongst the Greeks, despite the fact that he was also considered to be a great liar and fabricator. The Romans, however, did not consider him to be a hero, and the primary reason for that is that the Romans considered themselves descendants of the Trojans. So when the Roman poet Virgil sat down to write his Aeneid, he insisted that Odysseus was a scoundrel. When Dante, uh, several centuries later, writes his Divine Comedy, he agrees with Virgil. Ulysses is cast into hell in Dante's epic. He is in the eighth circle of hell in a spot um, that is reserved for fraudsters, appropriately enough. Now, um, the reason that Dante places Odysseus, who he calls Ulysses, the Latinized version of the name, the reason Ulysses is in hell is because he made a career out of lying. Dante could have stopped there. But he doesn't. He goes on to offer us a completely invented story about how Ulysses meets his end. It's not clear, at least on a first reading, why it's being offered, but it is intriguing. So the story is this. After struggling for 10 years to get back to his home in Ithaca, Ulysses, once there, finds himself increasingly restless. He feels the call of the wine-dark sea, and so he ultimately decides that he will gather some of his old shipmates and go to sea again. He explains himself to uh, Dante by saying this. Not tenderness for a son, nor filial duty toward my aged father, not the love I owed Penelope that would have made her glad could overcome the fervor that was mine to gain experience of the world. And so I set forth upon the open deep with but a single ship and that small band of shipmates who had not deserted me. Oh, brothers, I cried, do not deny yourselves the chance to know, following the sun, the world where no one lives. Alas, this foray into the unknown ends disastrously because the ship encounters a whirlpool which takes it around three times before dropping it to the bottom of the ocean, killing Ulysses and all of his men. What's the point of that invention on Dante's part, one wonders? I think a clue can be found in St. Augustine. In Book 10 of his Confessions, Augustine speaks about something he calls curiositas, Curiositas, according to Augustine, is an inordinate appetite for experience. The person who suffers from curiositas is always restless, is never satisfied with what he or she has, is always projecting into the future, making plans, scheming, dissatisfied with the present, forgetting the past. A person who suffers from curiositas is essentially restless, always looking for what's around the next bend, always trying to go over the next horizon, always finding something or at least seeking to find something that will pump up the adrenaline. This person will never find anything that ultimately satisfies him or her. There will always be a deep, deep appetite, a deep, deep hunger that is not at all fruitful, that in point of fact is destructive. So the key feature of a person suffering from curiositas is an inordinate desire for new experiences. And moreover, the person who suffers from curiositas has a rather belligerent uh, approach to that experience which is being sought. A curiositas person is like a conquistadore, wants to conquer, wants to grab, wants to make his or her own the experiences that he or she seeks. It's as if the person of curiositas is trying to flesh out a rather hollow existence by gorging on experiences. A gorging, of course, once again, that will never satisfy. 
I believe that Ulysses, at least as seen by Dante, is a person who is suffering from curiositas. Now, what's the alternative to that unfortunate condition? Well, Benedict, Benedict of Nursia, the founder of monasticism in the West, uh, does offer us an alternative. He calls it uh, stabilitas cordis. Stabilitas cordis means stability of heart, just as um, curiositas uh, can be translated as curiosity. Stability of the heart uh, means that an individual is willing to stay in the present, to learn what the present has to teach him or her, is not running hither and yon, is not frantically scurrying around to try and chalk up as many experiences as possible, but recognizes that that which the heart truly yearns for can be found if one remains in the present. Stability of heart is closely connected for Benedict with obedience. I know, I know, the word obedience tends to stick in the craw of those of us in the 21st century. But consider this, the word is actually a derivative of the Latin obidere. And obidere is uh, a verb that means to give uh, ear, to listen, to hear something that's being said. When we practice obedience, when we are trying to attain stability of heart, what we're not doing is, in a lockstep sort of way, following rules or directions. No, not at all. What we're doing is engaging in deep, deep listening. Listening to the silence of the presence. Listening to the still, small voice of meaning that we can discern when we are silent, when we have ceased our scurrying around, which we are, which when we are satisfied with what is given to us in the moment. And given to us is important here because the person who experiences stability of the heart, unlike Ulysses, unlike the person of Curiositas, doesn't see, uh, seek to conquer, doesn't seize experience and make it his or her own. No, quite the contrary. The person who experiences stability of the heart invites experience, opens arms to embrace experience. Instead of seizing experience, the person who has stability of heart invites the experience simply to be and to speak to him or her. St. Augustine says famously at the very beginning of his confessions that our hearts are restless until they rest in thee, O Lord. A person who suffers from curiositas will never be able to overcome that restlessness because we'll never be able to listen deeply, to obey, to stay still enough to discern the voice of God. The person who has stability of heart, however, will find rest from that restlessness. Why is Ulysses in hell? Yeah, yeah, he's in hell because he was a liar. True enough. But I think there's a deeper reason. I think that Ulysses, uh, Dante wants to suggest to us, was in hell even while he was alive. Because surely, to be eternally restless, to never find a place that one can be still and silent in, to never be able to open one's arms to the present, much less to God, is to be in hell. It is to live a life in which one is constantly and frustratingly seeking for a foundation, which one's very restlessness will not allow one to find. Friends, Let's use Ulysses as an example of a kind of lifestyle that you and I do not wish to succumb to. I'm Father Carey, and this has been another Holy Spirit moment. Thank you so much for watching. If you are of a mind to subscribe to this series, I truly do invite you to do so. Thank you. God bless. See you next time.